Happy Monday and happy holidays, little kitty cats, to whatever it is you celebrate. But today, not just today, but this whole week, actually we started two days ago on Christmas, but from now until the end of the year, until December 31st, you can get the best deal you could ever imagine over on our Patreon at patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. If you join on an annual membership, you will get not one, but two free months. That is up to a $200 value at the highest level. And we have all sorts of bonus content for our patrons. We have Brian's Daily Good Morning Bleep Head. We have Conspiracy Corner, Degenerate Gamblers, bonus segments with guests, live streams of most of my interviews, just so much content for as little as $5 a month. Of course, you can get so much more at various tiers. You can get monthly calls with guests, discounts on all our merchandise, which we will have um, a lot of new merchandise coming because we have brand new logos, brand new branding coming at you in 2022. Look out for that. But you can check it all out on Patreon at patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. We need to empower people with not just the philosophical tools, but the inspiration to break free from the system. Welcome to the flagship Lions of Liberty podcast, your weekly dose of education, inspiration, and real-world application from the top minds in the liberty movement. If you want liberty, we need to be better leaders, better husbands, better fathers, better friends, better businessmen. We need to be better people. Here's your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. Delivery. Almost recording. Now I'm recording. And I'm just going to get my backup going and then I'll get started. Mm-mm-mm. All right, kitty cats, I got a very special program for you today as I have two guests who are both making their return to this program as they have recently united for a common cause that we'll be talking about here in just a minute. First up, he is making his fourth, I can't believe it, fourth appearance here on Lions of Liberty. He is the host of the Expat Money Show, of which I was recently a guest. He is the author of the number one best-selling book, Expat Secrets. He has been an expat from his home country of Canada for more than 20 years. He's visited over 100 countries, and he left formal education at a very young age, uh, which will tie into what we're going to be discussing today. I'm very pleased to welcome back, once again, Mikkel Thorup. Mikkel, are you ready to roll? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Mark. Sure thing. Had a feeling you would be. Uh, Joining us as well, he is making his second appearance on this program. Last time he was on here to discuss the concept of startup cities, but he is perhaps better known uh, for his work in the field of education. He is one of the most experienced designers of innovative school programs in the United States. He is the author of several books, such as The Habit of Thought. I'm very pleased to welcome back Michael Strong. Michael, are you ready to roar? Roar! (laughs) <laughs> I told you I had a good roar, Mikhail. That's a very good <laughs> Didn't roar. Didn't believe me, but we, we've heard it here today. Um, and guys, as I mentioned up at the top, you guys are both uh, both recently co-founded a school. It's called the, well, I didn't mention it. I'm mentioning it now. Uh, you both recently co-founded the school. It is called the Expat International School. I, I have somewhat of a personal stake in this as well, as my stepson has been enrolled uh, in that school for the last several months. So um, not only am I interested in the concept of education overall, especially uh, from two uh, very solid, I, I would guess, liberty-centric individuals such as yourself, you might say, uh, but also I, I've kind of been, got to see a lot of this uh, live unfold uh, with someone who's never learned in this type of school before. So I'm really excited to talk about you know my, my personal experience it, with that school, but I do want to first get into both of your backgrounds with education a little bit. And uh, Mikhail, as I mentioned, you left formal education at a very young age. You did uh, tell this story in, a, in probably a, what will be a, a longer version of it uh, when you first appeared on the show several years ago. I will link to that episode in the show notes so people can go ahead and check that out. But why don't you just give maybe the the cliff notes version of um, your experience with uh, education as a, as a child. Sure, happy to. So, in a nutshell, what ended up happening was I was in grade three and I got diagnosed with a learning disability. So the teacher pulled me out of class and they brought me to a little room and sat me down with the vice principal and the principal and resource teacher and my teacher and a whole bunch of big scary adults and and they sat me down and they said, Mikkel, Mikkel, something doesn't work quite right in your brain. And what we want to do is we want to send you to a special school, special school for special boys. So that's what they did. Every day for three years, I got on a little white bus. I took a little white bus across town and I went to this special school. Now, the only problem, Mark, is it was not a special school. It was a regular school with just a special class. So what ended up happening was I got picked on. I got bullied. I got in fights. Um, I had pretty much a terrible experience. 
Now, this is no, I'm a victim, woe is me, feel bad for Mikel. Certainly not. Like, I hit, I hit back, usually twice as hard. Like, I'm not going to pretend otherwise. I certainly gave it back whenever I got whacked. But I left school, I left this, this, this quote-unquote special school with um, a very bad taste in my mouth. I really did not have a good time with education. But I thought, never mind, I'm going back now to my neighborhood school and I'm going to see all of my friends who have missed me and they're going to be wondering what happened to me and you know all of these things. Everyone's going to be so excited to see Mikel. Well, you can probably once again imagine what happened. So I showed up and they all started you know, whispering and gossiping. And, oh, I remember Mikel. He went to some retard school. 1980s, totally politically correct. Kids are very, very sensitive. You know how they are. So I started all over again with getting in fights and getting picked on and hitting back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and really just did not like it at all. So I stopped going. And then I'd fail, and then they'd send me to summer school, and then I'd fail that, and then they'd s somehow squeak me through, and then I'd fail the next year, and I basically just refused to go. So fast forward, uh, 12 years old, I stopped going to school, and at 15, I officially dropped out. And I started traveling internationally not shortly after that. And when I started traveling, I realized that there are actually so many amazing ways to learn things, so many different pathways to education, that traditional education is not the only way to go about it. Actually, there are many ways to do this th through mentorship, through travel, through living overseas, through reading many different ways that this can be done. Now, a lot of people would be very soured from their experience with public education. I actually use this as fuel to go out there and start something. So Michael and I partnered together. Well, we started talking probably close to two years ago, but partnered together uh, earlier this year and started the Expat International School because I really don't want what happened to me with public education to happen to anybody else. I have a very personal stake in these types of things. And honestly, you know, I've done a lot of crazy and amazing things in my life, but I would put this as one of the best things I've ever done. I am so passionate about it. I am so grateful um, that I have this opportunity to partner with Michael. He's such a brilliant individual and I just love the way that his mind works. And every time I speak with him and we speak on a daily, weekly basis, I'm always learning things. And it's really an honor to be able to build a school with him and help so many people. So that's kind of in a nutshell, my educational background. Right. And just to elaborate a little bit, um, you know, some people might think, well, who, who's this guy to be starting a school? He, you know, he's, he hasn't formally worked in education or anything like that, but you have informally educated yourself over several decades to the point where I, I think you probably are more successful, at least as an entrepreneur, than a very large percentage of people who simply went to public school. But in addition to that, um, maybe more importantly so, you also, you have two children and uh, neither of them have ever been to formal education. Is that correct? You've been homeschooling both of them? Yeah, I would consider myself a successful entrepreneur. I'm a seven-figure entrepreneur. I build multiple businesses. I've been traveling for 21 years straight. I host a podcast about living internationally and building businesses and investing. I've traveled to more than 100 countries. I've lived in nine different countries. I've circum circumnavigated the globe over 400 times. I have two children who were born in two different countries. Uh, my wife is from mainland China. We met in Africa, got married uh, met in Germany, got married in Africa. My daughter was born in the Middle East. My son was born in Brazil. We live in Panama now. Um, you know, lots going on about the expat and international stuff. Uh, I read a ridiculous amount, probably more than anyone you've ever met in your entire life. I spend hours and hours and hours and hours reading. So although I don't have a background in formal education or I never went to teacher's college or anything like this, um, I would say that I am a very educated person. I think that's safe to say. Uh, and, and Michael, uh, last time when you were on the show, we mostly discussed the topic of startup cities. Again, I will link to that interview in the show notes as well. That's a really fascinating topic, but not what we're here to speak about today. Uh, so if you could just go back and maybe elaborate a little bit more um, uh, on your experience in the education industry, uh, in the education field, how you first took interest in it and sort of some of the projects you have done up to this point. Well, absolutely. But before I get started, first, I want to thank Mikel for all the kind things he said. And also, I'm going to brag about Mikel's educational credentials. I'm a radically anti-credentialist. And so right. when Mikel drops out of school at 12 and educates himself and becomes 
a world-renowned expert in expat and a serial entrepreneur and so forth, I say, what a credential is that? Right. So for th- th- good, that is a credential in itself. Right? That's what a real credential is. So right. yeah, for me, if anybody applies as a teaching candidate and the first line is, I'm certified to teach, blah, 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 I throw it in the garbage. I want people who have actually done something. And Mikkel has done something. Thank so um, yeah, I, I love learning and I hate school. You know, uh, I'm a voracious reader, you know, right there with you, Mikkel. I read a huge amount. And I think school, my experience of school was, I did very well, actually. Straight A's, went to Harvard, but it was boring. Secondary school in particular were the most boring and cruel years of my life. As an adult, I am never bored. You know, constantly I've got, you know, 50 tabs going and reading and 30 projects and talking to people all over the world about all sorts of cool stuff. And, you know, I'm sure I'd be diagnosed with ADHD and they'd medicate the heck out of me. And, um, you know, without exaggerating, I might want to shoot myself if I was forced to go to school again. It's just so painfully to have somebody controlling your attention six hours a day when you're bored silly is cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah, and kids are mean. As an adult, if somebody's a jerk, I do not hang out with them. Simple, you know? But in school, you're kind of, you know, stuck in the cage with the other rats and they eat each other's tails. It's horrible. Um, So, yeah, I went to school. I loved it. I I hated, I mean, but I loved learning. I went to a college, St. John's College, Santa Fe, Annapolis, known for great books. There's Senate campuses in Santa Fe and Annapolis. I had to slow myself down. Uh, but where you talk about ideas, I love talking about ideas. So basically for the last 30 years, I've created schools where a core component is Socratic discussion where the kids read, think, and argue about ideas. And it turns out kids love to argue. And your stepson, <laughs> he, he start off quietly, but you get him going. He's got his ideas. He wants to defend his ideas. And that motivates thinking and talking and really um, learning. And so then we use that as kind of a platform for other things. My schools over time, and in addition to the Socratic piece, about 20 years ago, I started a nonprofit with John Mackey, the founder and CEO of Whole Foods Market. Um, There, we created a nonprofit devoted to entrepreneurial solutions to world problems. So I have one of the world's best networks of purpose-driven entrepreneurs. So in addition to the kind of Socratic intellectuality that we cultivate at the school, we uh, encourage each child to do a project and ultimately an entrepreneurial or creative project that can result in revenue. And so this idea, that's why the sub title of the school, so to speak, is um, freedom and entrepreneurship. So we're very much about freedom and entrepreneurship on a platform of high level reading, thinking, talking, uh, writing sorts of skills. And then beyond that cult specific, you know, if you were into math or engineering or art or, you know, music or whatever it is, we can specialize. But the big thing is high level, let's think and talk, argue about ideas. And then, uh, hey, do a project that's real world. If you could be a Mikkel Thorup by the time you're 18, you're a rock star. How do we help you get there? So that's kind of a high level thing of I've been doing this for 35 years and this is where I landed. So I want to focus a little bit more on the nexus of this particular like version of the school. That is, it's basically combining both of your expertises. Uh, Mikkel being literally probably the four the world's foremost expert on being an expat, and Michael being one of the leading experts on education. But your your educational endeavors have mostly with, been within the United States previously, whereas this is specifically catered to international students. So maybe Mikkel, you could just kind of um, you know elaborate on how this idea came up, like how did that kind conversation went between you two and how we got to this point where we are today, where the schools are already been launched and already going. Well, as a lot of things do in my life, um, this all started with podcasting. Go figure, eh? Uh, Michael was a guest on my show and normally my episodes are about 60 minutes. I think Michael and I went for about two and a half hours or something like that. Just, <laughs> it was a pretty but, long one. It was a long <laughs> one. Someone who hears really all your episode. episodes. It's a fantastic yeah. episode. And we're, you know, talking about ideas and all of these types of things. And I'm like leaning in on the entire conversation. Just so many questions because I just, I really wanted to know and understand things. So we, you know, we did our interview together and then we started talking on email and then phone calls. And then Michael was running a program called When School's Not Working. They invited me to be a guest there. And so lots of back and forth. 
And we started playing with this idea of taking a lot of Michael's ideas from the domestic U.S. market and bringing them international because there are a lot of problems that face international schools and there's not a lot of great solutions. And, and I'm happy to kind of go into a little bit of the challenges for anybody who does want to move overseas so they understand what the landscape looks like. And um, so I think one one challenge that uh, probably a lot of students that might have that might have gone into one of Michael's programs previously m might face is just a very it's a very different approach to education. A lot of students are just used to getting grades, being told exactly what they have to do, when they have to do it, how they have to do it. Um, you just take tests and get those letter or number grades. So it's already sort of a different um, a different kind of thinking when it comes to education. But not to brag too much, but I, I'm really impressed with my stepson because he's not uh, not only going into a different type of education, but he's also the this is the first time he's learning in a different language. He's been learning mostly in English. He grew up speaking Spanish. Now he speaks pretty good English because mostly because of video games, which is also oddly enough how my wife learned English like 30 years ago. Um, but what are some of the challenges that that kids face? Kind of like because you're actually catering to international students, so a lot of these students may end up not only uh, facing a different type of education, but also be learning in different languages and, and maybe facing that challenge at once. Uh, what is that the overall approach, uh, you know, to to kind of facing those two challenges head on at the same time? Yeah, OK, sure. well, I'll let Michael go in on the education piece itself, but I'll speak to the expat piece. So what normally happens when a person moves to another country and they want to put their child in education, they'll use international schools which are fine, but it's just a rehashing of domestic schools just in an international market. So you'll have the International School of Canada, the International School of the US, the International School of Germany, and it's just their normal curriculum, which is overseas. So if you don't agree with the curriculum that you were facing when you were back in your home country, well, you're going to get more of the same. The only big difference here is you're going to have kids from all over the world, which is nice. But the other big difference is they're going to slap a 20000 maybe $30,000 price tag on it. So you're getting basically public education, but it's costing you a lot of money. Um, the other big program or the other big problem is sometimes people think, ah, I'll just put my kids in a homeschooling program. You know, I'm, I'm a big proponent for homeschooling. I've been telling everybody that I'd be homeschooling my kids for 30 years. When I was a kid, I wanted to have kids. And I told everybody, like, I would never put my kids in education. But a lot of the homeschooling programs are really low touch. They're video programs. Maybe they were recorded five or seven years ago. And now you your, sit, your kid sits down, watches the video, and now they have to write a report about it. But if they have questions, who do they go to? What are the discussion? Where's the arguing or the, the discussion about ideas, like Michael mentioned? A lot of these things don't exist. So those are some of the, pro the problems. Another big one for the international is, as an expat, a lot of people will move to a country. They'll live there for one, two, possibly three years. And then mom will get a job somewhere else or dad will get a job somewhere else. And they'll move to another country. Well, those kids, not only do they have to say goodbye to the country that they were in, but they have to say goodbye to all of their friends that they just started getting accustomed to. Now, with our program, it runs from the ages of 8 to 19. So if you come in at 18 years old and you're living in um, Abu Dhabi, where I used to live, I lived in Abu Dhabi for eight years, and you're living there for two, three years, and then they move to Frankfurt, and then they're there for a couple of years, and they move to Singapore because their dad works in finance or their mom works in finance or something, which is a very, very common thing. They get to actually keep the same friends the entire time. So it's not so jarring. Now your kids are actually on board to go and live in a new country. They don't have to say goodbye to everyone. So you get like the best of both worlds. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, especially in an age when so many of our friends are online, uh, school might be one of the last places where you make a bunch of friends and then you just get ripped away from them at some point in life. Uh, whereas at least like when you're in a school like this, you know, the friends Rennie's making now, like he can take those friends with him uh, either way, even if he's not in the same school, he could, he could do that since we have so many ways to communicate now. But I think it's pretty cool that, you know, moving any of these kids moving from somewhere is not going to rip them out of, of the, the friends they make in school. Uh, Michael, maybe you can speak more to sort of the the challenge of of converting from many many kids going from sort of the the old model of education as I'd like to think of as the old model the, the dying model of just teaching you know it's basically the Prussian model of education you are being taught to be a good soldier a good factory worker to follow instructions to respond to a bell at a certain time to ask permission when you have to go to the bathroom and uh, your method of teaching couldn't be more opposite than that. So, uh, but what are some of the challenges and benefits that that children, that kids face when they're when going from one to the other? 
Yeah, well, I, I think first I want to talk about the parents because the parents matter. Um, mm -hmm. Even in the U.S., in my, most of the last 20 years, I've been in the San Francisco Bay Area or Austin, and most of my parents have been entrepreneurs or creative professionals. Um, now I've spoken to about 50 prospective parents and some current parents from Expat International School. And I would say what they really have in common is the parents are very entrepreneurial. So some of them are explicitly entrepreneurs. I uh, um, spoke with an entrepreneur in Australia, uh, Eastern Australia yesterday, who's about to sell his business. And, you know, we've got, um, you know, actually an entrepreneur in Oregon who's a current student, but want to be expat. Um, we've got, I've got somebody who's an English teacher in the Middle East, and you think, well, an English teacher isn't entrepreneurial, but, you know, this guy left the U.S., has been traveling around the world as an expat, and is really taking initiative. So for me, a key trait of an entrepreneur is somebody who takes initiative and adds value. And going back to the school issue, I see regular school as jumping through hoops. I personally regard them as meaningless hoops. There are some careers um, where you're just jumping through meaningless hoops in the career. So I, I kind of differentiate whether at the school or career level, people kind of passively do what's put in front of them versus people who take initiative to add value to make a difference. And so the reason this is relevant is that because most of our parents coming into expat are entrepreneurial, whether or not they're entrepreneurs, their kids find much less of an adaptation challenge. I mean, Rene is a great example. He was in a very conventional school. I would say, you know, it took a few weeks trying to check it out. What are we, what's the game? What are we doing? But he just dove right in. And I would say that the kids that don't work for our program would be, and this is from decades of experience, where the kids are used to the passive version and the parents are used to the passive version. Mm -hmm. And so they have no models of um, go out and get something done. Whereas when the kids see their parents as somebody who takes initiative to figure things out, it's not such a quick bridge. They, I think they take to it as, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And in fact, some of them were problem kids in regular schools because you know there's a whole literature on how entrepreneurs get into trouble in school. Richard Branson's a high school dropout, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, college dropouts, John Mackey, college dropout. I think people who wanna get things done are impatient with waiting uh, to raise their hand to go to the bathroom and can I go to the next problem? And you know, I try not to be mean, but I think for all of us and the kind of people we attract, what is this wait and wait to be told what to do kind of thing? So I think, you know, given the parent population we're pursuing, uh, could be a few weeks adjustment, maybe in a couple of cases, a few months, but mostly it's like, yeah, this is how I'm supposed to be living life. Right. Yeah, I never thought about it as much that way from my perspective, but, you know, he sees uh, both of us, you know, just, we, I'm going off and doing podcasts. Like I don't, he doesn't see some boss coming in and telling me you have to go do a podcast now, Mark. So, and same with Diane, she's always working on, on other projects. Um, you know, neither of us have someone harping at us and, and, and telling us what to do with our day. Uh, we're just out there doing stuff. Uh, so I'm sure that does actually rub off in some way and maybe, you know, kind of show, okay, well, if, if, if they're not being bossed around, maybe I don't need to be bossed around either. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. And in some ways I see, I, I think most of the interesting jobs in the 21st century will require entrepreneurial initiative. And, you know, I think kids, I, I actually think kids that are accustomed to the passive format, um, even if they get good grades and test scores, I think they're going to be at a disadvantage because everything, you know, we've all worked in startups, whether you're actually starting up a project or even if it's a nonprofit, people who take initiative and work with others to get things done are valuable. People who wait to be told what to do are not valuable. I don't care what your test scores are. Yeah. And, and for you, Mikkel, you learned that that skill like almost by force, like almost because school failed you so bad that it was almost your only choice to, to go out there. Uh, I mean, you could have just, you know, decided to, to be a bum and just stay in school and be a bad kid and, you know, go down a dark path. But it likely you chose like a, a better way to channel that into becoming an entrepreneur, into traveling the world. And, and one thing that, you know, d strikes me a lot talking to both of you is that you know, I think to most people like being like education is one thing and entrepreneurship or business is like, is some other thing entirely. But even when talking about these subjects with you guys, it's, it's almost like the lines are so blurred. You can barely even tell what they are. And, and I think that's one thing I really love about this approach to education and about the idea that these kids are going in there, not just to check box off of, you know, check 13 things that they learned today and repeat them. Uh, they're actually learning skills by 
almost being enforced into what for many of them, especially ones that did come from more passive school program or, you know, one where they're just being told what to do each and every day. That might be more of a, a transition for them, uh, but it, it is continuing to build those skills that one way or another, they're going to have to become entrepreneurs anyway. So I, I just love that they're getting these skills early on by force in a way, but by not being dedicated to their sort of force to, uh, you know, pursue things on their own. So, uh, Michael, maybe, maybe you can speak to that a little more, how entrepreneurship, especially for you has been your education and you know, how maybe some of the, the lessons that you learned just by becoming an entrepreneur can actually be applied into the school and how, and the approach, you know, how you approach entrepreneurship and, and, and kind of teaching what that is to children. Very good question. Okay. So I think that Entrepreneurship is so multifaceted that it is really difficult to put a pin on exactly like one thing or one skill that is needed. I mean, I have to wear so many hats in my business from simple things like knowing and understanding video editing or podcast production, because that's some mediums that I use, or the ability to write and convey ideas that are not really worked on at all during normal education. Those are things that certainly in our curriculum, we do focus on. Um, there's so many different types of technology. There's the ability to actually motivate myself to do things and then trying to encompass that in the program. You know, I was talking to, I have, I have a young mentee who, uh, is a student at our school and I was chatting with him a week or so ago and he was saying, you know, I didn't do a project the other day and no one nagged me about it. No one was on my case and no one bugged me about it. And a day went by and a couple of days went by and no one said anything. Then I started to feel bad. And then I decided I want to do it because no one was pushing me to do it. And it was actually interesting. So then I went and did it. And I was like, wow, okay. So that's a pretty good realization at 16, 17 years old that actually you have to have self-motivation that you need to have willpower and, and understand these things because in the real world, nobody is going to be behind you kicking your butt. And if they are, I mean, that's probably not a type of job that you want to have. So trying to look at so many different aspects of entrepreneurship and how you incorporate them into the school is not always so apparent, but in a subtle ways, they're all over the place. And if I could sort of add, so I want to go to two sort of extremes of our program to do kind of a concrete example of what Mikkel's talking about. You know, mathematics is the most linear part of the program. You know, there's a sequential sequence in math the students go through. And then I want to talk about projects a bit more as Mikkel did. You know, in mathematics, uh, we do have a standard self-paced uh, adaptive math software where the kids are expected to do one year of math as a standard, but um, we want them to own their own education. So in some cases, we say, well, if you want to be an engineer, why don't you do a year, year and a half, two years, three years, four years? I had one student do four years of math one year. But basically, hey, Mark, if you're really you know ambitious, why are you only doing one year? What's going on there? Or if you know math is a struggle, or maybe you had a bad math teacher or something, um, well, maybe we should do less than a year of math and you know work with your parents. Let's have a conversation. If it's appropriate for you to do less than a math a year of math, let's talk about it. And so even the linear math curriculum, there is a role for the student in terms of, yeah, I want to take on more. Um, no, maybe I shouldn't take on more. Or let's, I do want to take on just the right, you know, the regular amount. And so there's ownership. And so the point is, whatever math goals the student sets in collaboration with a, a faculty and the parents, there's some ownership. And because we're we're not dictating it, you know, yeah, most of you, it's useful to take math. How much are you going to commit to? And once you commit to a year's worth of math, okay, this is monthly expectations, weekly expectations, and so forth. But then if they fall behind, we can say, okay, uh, you're not on track. Does that mean you want to keep doing it over the summer? Or do you want to lower your math goals? Do you work more hours? You know, again, we're just very pragmatic. Uh, what's your game plan? Let's work together so that you're actually, um, you know, walking the walk. You know, if you say you're going to do a year's worth of math and you're not, that's a problem. But whatever you say you're going to do, we're just here to support you and keep you honest. And then on the going the other direction, projects, we expect every student to have a project, but it's their own thing. They have total carte blanche in terms of what it is. And we coach them in terms of, hey, if you're an artist, it's useful to learn how to make money. So, you know, can you figure out how to make a living on this? But again, we're trying to be their coaches in order to help them become peak performers. And, um, you know, really, they have to they have to step up and say, yeah, uh, this is who I want to be. And I've had conversations with kids who play too much video games. And 
yeah, do you want to be playing video games? I your... might know one of those, but yeah, yeah, in your mom's <laughs> basement when you're 30? No, 20? No, 18? Well, maybe not. Okay, so when are you gonna? When are you gonna? You know, get a life basically, and and most of them come around pretty well, you know, and that's they they see other kids taking initiative too. So when they mm. see kids as rock stars in their projects, do you want to be the kid who's not really doing much when you could do anything, but you're not? Um, so there's also this kind of peer pressure to be doing something cool and sharing it with your community. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, that parallels the real world so much more than school does. I mean, ha it, it, we're all humans. I think we're all motivated a little bit, even if it's subconsciously by seeing the success of others around us. And, and, you know, there's that phrase of, uh, you know, surrounding yourself, you know, the, you're, you're the most like the five people you surround yourself with the most. So if you're in school with some bunch, a bunch of kids and they're, you know, maybe you're in work groups with them and they're doing these killer projects, like you, you're just naturally going to want to rise to their, to their level or above their level. Cause you're not going to be the one, be the one left behind in that group. Well, it, exactly. And I think as long as you give people flexibility and adolescents in particular, you know, the kid who's a math guru, you don't want to force him to have to be an art genius. The kid who's an art genius, don't force him to, you know, be a math rock star. You know, obviously some kids are both, but you know, when you give kids different ways to shine, we talk about, we want to discover and develop your child's genius. And that means we recognize there are 7 billion kinds of genius on earth. What's yours and how can we work together to develop it? And kids like that. And when I interview kids, my question is, what do you love? Um, what do you want to be amazing at? And they've never been asked this. You know, no school asks, what do you love? What are you going to be amazing at? You're like, well, blah, 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 grades, test scores. Yeah. No, no. Who are you wanting to be amazing? What do you want to be amazing at? All right, Kitty Cats, time to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors at I Trust Capital. You've heard me talking about these guys for quite some time now. They've been a tremendous sponsor, and I really want to encourage you guys, if you are investing in cryptocurrencies or if you are looking to invest in cryptocurrencies, to check out I Trust Capital. These guys help you do this not only very easily, very cheaply with the lowest fees in the industry, uh, but you can actually do that through their traditional IRA setup to protect those gains for your future. And now there is literally Literally, literally starting today, there is no better time to sign up for an account with iTrust Capital. Why? Let me tell you why. Starting today, they are removing their monthly fee. So you can sign up and you do not have to pay any monthly fee for doing so. Also, they are now giving $100 worth of Bitcoin to everyone that signs up through our link and funds their account. You can find that link at iTrust.Capital slash Lions. That's right. $100 of free Bitcoin for signing up and funding your account. And now there are no fees. So this is literally the best time to sign up for iTrust Capital. Go check it out at itrust.capital slash lions. Yeah. One, one thing I want to, I want to circle back to is the issue of language, uh, because especially this being the international version of the school, like, uh, is this a school that anybody could join almost from having any language background? Uh, do, do, do the, the clients that you're reaching out to now and the parents you're connecting to, do they all have to have, you know, some base in English or can, can they almost come from almost any language? Like, like how much of, of this program for the international school is catered towards, you know, teaching a new language in addition to this new learning method. And, and Mikhail, you can probably comment on this as well, just because you, I know you raise your, um, your, your, your daughter you know, learning multiple language. So um, maybe it hasn't been done in a formal education format, but you certainly know the, the trials, tribulations, but more so I think benefits of children learning uh, multiple languages from a young age. Michael, do you want to go first on this one? And then I'll, I'll chime in afterwards because I, I have some points from the personal side, but yeah. Yeah. So de facto, most of our students already are speaking English, even if they're expats. I would say the, the North American expat market is a major one. We also do have some children for whom English is very much a second language. And as long as they have reasonable um, fluency, not an issue at all. We also have some students for whom they're just beginning English. And I would say it's slower and takes longer. And um, as we get larger cohorts of those, we'll have kind of specialized English on-ramps. Um, so I would say as long as they have kind of middling level English, uh, again, you know, kids learn from other kids way better than they will ever learn from adults. Um, you know, everybody knows kids who move to another country and on the playground within a few weeks, basically they're functional. A few weeks after that, they're fluent. And so that kind of immersion in peers is the most powerful way to learn a language. And this is because the peers are talking. It's not teachers talking at you. Basically, you're in a context where peers are talking in the target language all day. They develop fluency pretty quickly, um, you know, and we 
we with real beginners, we need more of an on ramp. I, I just to elaborate on that, just from my seeing my own, uh, you know, Renny and and his growth here. Um, I, I think English. He, when I first met him, he was already speaking pretty good English, and I was like, oh, they teach really good English in these Mexican schools. And she's like, not really. Like they teach them like a word a day. You know, and they're not really teaching how to speak. Uh, but the reason he was able to speak so fluently is because he has is maybe plays too much video games. But those too much video games have introduced him to people all over the world. All of which, like you know, they communicate. They all communicate in English, no matter where they are. All these you know, all these video game kids. So uh, it is sort of the universal language of video games. Uh, so while me, he might have learned some words formally in school, the fact that he could naturally just talk to me in English without really thinking about it, um, that all just becomes from that real world peer to peer experience, not so much from the formal education. I think that there's a lot to learning languages, and it's something that I certainly want to focus when we're looking at the curriculum. So you have it from multiple fronts. You have it from the non-native English speakers who are entering the program. So. As you gave as an example, Rennie speaks Spanish as a first language, but spoke English. But I think after three, four months now, his English is probably at a higher level. Whether you notice it in day-to-day -day conversation or not, just discussing more advanced texts, his vocabulary is going to grow quite a bit. We have another family where their son is from Thailand. He was in a public education in Thailand. There were 60 kids per class. He got very little interaction with the teacher. Mostly they were just babysitting and trying to make sure that kids didn't goof off. So now you put them in a program like ours, which is a maximum of 15. It's cons considerably different. And he's really blossoming. And I've had dinner with, they, they happen to be here in Panama as, as expats. So I had dinner with his parents recently and was able to talk to him in a way that I wasn't able to do, you know, six months ago or a year ago when I had dinner with them then. So seeing the differences in the children as they grow and their interaction and their speed with the language is, is phenomenal. Languages, what we also want to be able to focus on is, is two other things. We want to be able to offer the entire program eventually in a second language. So we would like to do a Spanish version of it. This is not right now, but in the future, we would like to do an entire Spanish version. So this does a couple of things. It's actually going to open up for families who live here in Latin America and want their child to learn Spanish or for families who the child does not yet speak English and they want to have them in a native English or native Spanish speaking program. So there's going to be a lot that is going to be done there. Then on the third front, we want to be able to add secondary, tertiary, different types of second languages uh, to the kids. My daughter is five years old. She speaks Mandarin, Chinese, English, and Spanish at native or near native level for all three languages. We were going to teach her German for her fourth language, but we've switched, changed to Russian. We are now focusing on Russian. We have a whole bunch of techniques. So she will learn four languages. A lot of the things that I learned on how to teach kids multiple languages, I learned from interviewing some of the greatest polyglots in the world on my program at the Expat Money Show. We have people Subtle like Holly Ridges. Silent plug. There we go. Go download the episodes. Plug, yeah. yeah. And expatmoneyshow.com. I'll give you the full plug. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing to, to hear these people who speak like eight languages and how they went about it. You know, we're going to be doing a partnership and we might as well kind of announce it right now. We're going to be doing a partnership with a really dear friend of mine. His name is Ollie Richards. He okay. does a fantastic program called I Will Teach You a Language. His method is called story learning. And we're going to be offering a lot of these courses and, and this specialized uh, ability to acquire languages will be taught through his program. So. There's so many amazing things that we're going to be doing with languages that are going to really help international families, which you would just never, ever get in public education. Public education for language learning is rote memorization mm -hmm. from someone who doesn't really speak the language all that well, usually. And it's just memorizing vocabulary or verb tables or conjugation. And at the end of uh, four years of high school Spanish, most people can get by like hardly at all. They can't really oh, say too much. I I can speak to that experience very personally. I took, I think, four years of high school Spanish and maybe another year or two of college Spanish and then went traveling and realized how much I couldn't speak Spanish at all because I may have learned, and I think it's, it's speaking to the exact same thing. Like I was learning test taking Spanish. I was learning how to memorize a word and then match that word somewhere on a test later, but I was never, and maybe even to write paragraphs, and but never really learning to speak, speak, speak. You know, I can speak with other students who also 
aren't really fluent. Uh, I could speak with the teacher who, like you said, probably wasn't really fluent. She's not going home and speaking Spanish. Uh, I can say my Spanish and look, it's still, it still needs work, uh, but it's gotten better just from, from nothing more than just being in Mexico and being around people speaking Spanish more. Uh, I find I'm, I'm able to now start reacting to Spanish more instead of, uh, you know, where I was always finding myself three sentences behind because I'm, I'm trying to catch up on the translation, but that's, that's my brain being stuck in the old learning mode where I'm trying to translate as I go, as opposed to just sort of your, your brain understands the language. Uh, and I, and just to speak to Ali Richard's course as well, I recently started taking his course because I wanted to take my Spanish to a new level and right away. And then granted, I've only been taking it for a couple of weeks here, but I was blown away by how obvious his methods should have been to me, like where you're just learning by listening, which is the very similar to how I'm learning by listening in real life here. Uh, but that it just makes so much sense to me to, and to your brain, I think more importantly to learn via listening and via story than by learning through this old, you know, this, this, this sort of dogmatic memorization method, which maybe I remember words, but you're, they can, they quickly go away if you're not applying them and using them in everyday life because it's not learned in context. You need to learn everything in context. And that's really what we focus on. Um, not rote memorization, understanding to a deep level. So you're taking ideas and concepts and taking them from working memory and moving them to your long-term memory. That's where you're really going to keep them forever. That's how we're going to be teaching languages. That's how we teach a lot of things is the internalization of all of this. One thing I want to uh, you guys to speak on, I think there might be a lot of people listening now that, you know, they're especially if they're just libertarians, but aren't necessarily expats, uh, they might know all the problems with formal education. In fact, they might currently be in, be in situations where, yeah, sure, maybe they saw problems with education before, but it was just maybe something they could deal with at home because their, their child could come home from school, they could go over the work with them, supplement it in some way, perhaps. But now maybe their child has to go to school and has to mask or has to put a, a stick of vaccine in them to go to public school. So I think I think there are a lot of parents that might have gotten comfortable with the idea of working within the public school system in some way that now are just seeing that as just completely a, a non-starter because of how much things have changed in the last year and a half. Or, you know, I, I know parents that their their kids get, you know, they, they talk to a kid who tests positive with COVID is never sick, but they got to take their kid out of school for two weeks suddenly. And it just disrupts the whole, the whole thing. Uh, so I think there are many, many parents out there that regardless of if they're even thinking about becoming expats are definitely thinking about different kinds of schooling. So uh, maybe you can both speak to this. Is this for just only for people that are going to be international or could this just be for a regular family too, that is thinking, I, this is not working for me. I cannot be I cannot possibly morally send my child back to a public school for one more semester. Maybe this is a way to bridge my bridge our way out of that. Either yeah. can speak. So I think that the idea of the school is international. It doesn't mean that you actually have to be living overseas. If you're living in wherever it is in the United States or Canada, you're a hundred percent welcome. If you want your child to have a education, which is based on values of freedom and Liberty. I mean, I wouldn't brand us as, succinctly a libertarian school, although I will certainly say I am very libertarian with my values, uh, certainly not from the political side, but from my values, I am extremely libertarian. So a lot of me and, comes and when Mikkel says stuff. not from the political side, just to clarify, I know what he means. He means screw the LP who cares about that. Not that I don't know anything about the LP. Much. So sorry, anybody from the I mean, I'm not even American myself. So He's I'm, a Canadian in, 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 in Panama who left 20 years ago. So I don't follow the LP at all. But um, I do hold the values of liberty and freedom and peace to my core, who I am. Those are, that is my North Star. I will absolutely come out and say that. Now, a lot of this comes through the school. So if you don't like the political situation, if you don't like what is happening with public education, then Expat International School might be a good option for you. It is also a huge advantage because the world is growing. I mean, it is no secret internationalization is is a huge thing that people need to understand. Multiple languages dealing with different cultures, different history, different religions, um, different types of people in different situations of different ages who come from different backgrounds with different perspectives. That is the world that we live in and it continues to grow. So if you want your child to be competitive in this new environment, then having an international experience is really valuable. And, and just to that point, um, <laughs> excuse me, First, the, in terms of COVID, I would say one thing that COVID really did is expose more to parents. Ugh, excuse me. I do have the UV light, Mikkel. It's just I'm not at home. But <laughs> I think we need it. to cut this one, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
but just how yeah, I'll, I'll cut out your cough. Don't worry. Yeah. yeah okay. uh, just how boring and meaningless school is. So I think as a lot of parents saw the school curriculum piped into their homes online, they're just, oh my God, I can't believe my kids have to stop through this. Mm, yeah. The other thing um, I think is, you know, in the U S the whole critical race theory is the headline, but really I think the issue is that children are taught that everyone's a victim or oppressor on racial metrics. And what's mm. interesting here is I've had several African expats moving to the U.S. who don't want their kids going to public or private schools because they don't want their, you know, proud, uh, optimistic, capable African, black African children being taught they're a victim. And I, I'm afraid even at the best, so-called best private schools in the U.S., many of them systematically teach everybody they're either a victim or an oppressor. And in terms of, you know, we don't need to call this libertarian, but just how about being optimistic and confident and responsible? Um, I think I think 20 years from now, hopefully five years from now, people will look at this, everyone's a victim or oppressor thing as a really sick lens through which to teach every child. You know, I can't even believe they're doing it. And so I'm seeing people leaving uh, the system for all kinds of reasons, including the boredom and meaninglessness, um, but also, yeah, uh, who wants their kid to be disempowered? It's stupid. <laughs> right. Well, and, and just <laughs> just by nature, if you're creating, you know, children and students that come out of this type of schooling uh, who are more honest, who are able to discuss serious issues. I mean, that, that was one thing I that just blew me away when I saw like some of the topics you guys discuss, uh, things like, you know, it, is it okay to lie? Um, you know, like d deep philosophical questions that really you can go in a lot of directions with. Like, I never was challenged to think about things like this in school at all, not even in the most remote way. And to to be able to see young children being challenged with these ideas and being allowed to just just sort it out and and talk it out amongst each other. I mean, that is just so radically different of a method of schooling than than I ever had the opportunity to have when I was a kid. So that's one thing I'm just enjoying so much being able to see. I'm almost I almost want to go into the school. You know, I I want to be in his classes because I'm just I'm kind of jealous that I never got that kind of education. I had to give it to myself more as a later in life, more as an adult when I finally realized, oh yeah, I didn't actually learn anything about life in school. I did learn how to answer some questions and how to take some tests, but it didn't prepare me for this stuff whatsoever. I had to end up doing that on my own. Uh, so I think it's just so awesome these kids to get to have a head start in that, just in that, that mindset, which you just don't get from public, um, public education. Uh, well, well, one thing, thank, yeah, go thank ahead. You. I just want to, that's such a great example, Mark. I wanted to connect it because going back to independent and responsible, I think, you know, kids, everybody is constantly, you know, lie, not lie, you know, shades of truth, how frank, how honest and so forth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can tell kids don't lie, but it's so much more powerful for have, them to have an honest conversation with each other about when and where they might lie, might not lie, shade the truth a little bit. And then sure, like, it's okay to lie to the cops. We can teach them that. Not, that that's <laughs> half of a joke, but not really, but maybe. <laughs> but, but yeah, they, they come to their own, they decide who they are and what they stand for. And that's, I would say, fundamental to being a responsible agent in the adult world. Who am I and what do I stand for? Sure. Uh, I, I just want to go over a couple of questions that might be popping up in the minds of uh, parents. I almost have potential parents, <laughs> or maybe potential parents too. Um, you know, people might be thinking really ahead here uh, that they might be thinking uh, when it comes to putting, uh, you know, putting their children in a school, child in a school like this. And obviously, they can also schedule a call and actually talk to you guys about this. But maybe we can address some of these uh, right here, right now. And I, I think one of these things just goes back to the fact that it's a very different kind of method of teaching. Uh, it's based on the Socratic method, Socratic questioning. Maybe first, before I ask some more detailed questions, maybe you could just elaborate a little more, Michael, just on what that means, like and how that is so different from what from the, what the more traditional methods uh, that they would get in the public school. Yeah, let me let me walk you through a standard middle school day, just elementary and high school are similar, but um, yeah, we first of all, ten a.m. to four p.m. Um, Central Time is a standard schedule, so we start a little bit later, which is nice. Um, you know, Pacific, it's still H, but uh, and we'll eventually have time zones around the world. We're looking at a European time zone and possibly an Asian one soon. Um, but the first half hour community, we let kids connect. We believe that especially in a virtual school, it's important for them to build relationships so they can talk and hang out and so forth. That's great. Then we get into the personal growth. And your example of, you know, a line is one of the personal growth topics. We've talked about how do I learn from my mistakes? Um, how do I set goals? What do I do if I'm, when I'm angry? We have half an hour of uh, 15 to 1, as Mikhail said, where we're talking about these issues related to how do I become a better version of who I am? 
And I think that's very powerful. Then a little break, and then Socratic, that's where we read something complex together, philosophy, poetry, economics, whatever, and discuss the ideas in it. So it's a bit more academic and so forth as they're reading something. It's typically something complex. They learn to read more complex material, but they're arguing it with each other. And kids love to argue. So a lot of times kids will visit and they want to transfer in the next day because they love it so much. Kids if love anything it. might make them libertarians uh, more than anything else, it might be to learn to love to argue. Because <laughs> that's <go>. definitely <laughs> <laughs> part of the club. Um, you know, then writing, then they're expected to write based on what they've been arguing. A lot of flexibility in what they write, but we do want them to learn to reflect in writing what they've been thinking about. Um, projects, they're expected to be a, do a project that is of their own interest, but they're expected to learn to set goals and develop that project into a bigger, bigger thing. And then, yeah, middle school math and science, math, they do have the individualized self-paced curriculum. They also do group problem solving, which is fun talking and arguing about how to solve math while they also cover whatever they've committed to mathematically. And then science includes both, you know, the experiments as well as the Socratic discussion on science. What is evidence? What is, um, you know, what is science? What is rationality? How do we know when something's been proven? What's a theory? That kind of thing. So you, you don't know, just teach them science is whatever, like Anthony Fossey says, you, you go a little no, deeper no, than no. that. We want them to think about it and we want yeah, them to come to their own judgment. Uh, bit by bit in every discipline and own their own education and their own opinion. All right. So one thing I think parents that are used to a traditional education might be a little thrown off by, and that a lot of students might be very excited about <laughs> is to hear that they do not get grades and they don't get traditional grades. Uh, so how do parents get feedback? How do the children get feedback? And if they're not being held accountable by this traditional grade system that we've all become accustomed to here in Mexico, it was like a one through 10. Rennie was like a straight 10 student uh, before going into this. So he mastered that kind of schooling. Uh, so, but you know, how do you get feedback to the parents and kids and how, what kind of accountability is there to make sure that, you know, a kid's not getting the equivalent of F's, but not even knowing that and not, you know, not able to improve upon that, but, you know, how, so how, I think that's the one thing that's going to be hard for a lot of parents to wrap their heads around uh, not having ever been exposed to that concept before? Yeah, no, great question. First, at the high school level, we offer both an accredited version and an unaccredited version. The accredited version does require traditional letter grades, A, B, C, D, and uh, you know, computing and GPA and so forth. And that's because some parents um, prefer that for the high school. We can get students in the unaccredited program into colleges, you know, if they have great SAT scores and projects and so forth. So it really is a case-by-case -case basis, but we do offer the traditional grades as a high school option for parents that want that. Um, at the middle school option, you know, we have quarterly reports, which are like report cards, but it's narrative, and we talk about what they're doing and so forth. And then also, if students are not working, the guides, we call them guides rather than teachers, can reach out to parents and talk about it. And with some students, we've had conferences, a few students, multiple conferences, um, but the idea is you know, the, the every child should be at grade level performance or higher in math, reading and writing. And if they're, unless there's been an agreement. So if we all agree the student's gonna do less than half a year math, then as long as they're on track to that. But if the goal is a year versus math, we wanna be talking about that. The idea is grade level mastery. And within that, um, communicate with parents in terms of, yeah, are they on the ball? Are they responsible and so forth or not? Systematically through quarterly reports and um, informally when a need arises. Um, and some students, no need at all. Other students needs a little bit more. We're really flexible with all of these things. So it really comes down to the family themselves, what they want for the child, what the child wants for themselves. And we can tailor make a lot of these things based on those needs. Yeah. Just, just to follow up on that, you did, you did kind of allude to a little bit, um, is the concept, you know, there might be a lot of children or, or parents that might think, okay, like I'm willing to experiment with this kind of school. It's, it sounds like, you know, I, I like everything I'm hearing here on Lions of Liberty, but what if my child wants to go to a more formal education? Like what if they do, uh, want to become a doctor or, or engineer or something that will require a college degree of some kind. Now we could probably do a whole nother podcast about all the problems with higher education and all that, but let's leave that aside for now. Uh, cause obviously certain professions do require it. So how, how can, other than the accreditation aspect, like, like how do, how have you experienced colleges taking to people, you know, kids that come out of a program like this? Are they able, are they, do they face challenges uh, of getting into college because they didn't go to a, a more traditional school or as long as they're accredited and, you know, have, have the right grades, is it, is it almost the same thing? So I want to um, kind of back up a little bit. 
um, I'm US centric, so I'll focus on US. And there, mm. the SAT is a big test. Um, I have looked into A levels for British system schools. Outside of um, US and British system, I'm less familiar with it. And so as we get kids want to go to German universities or you know, French universities, we'll address that. But with respect to US and A levels are not that different. Um, the SAT actually is math and reading. And on the reading section, our students do better than average on the SAT because it's basically a very high level reading exam. Most kids don't read much of anything, or if they read, they read really easy stuff. So by simply reading complex texts every day and discussing them analytically, we do administer in the high school the SAT using a free Khan Academy practice exam three times a year. So we actually are more SAT focused than our more schools and our students do better on the SAT than they do at most schools. Yeah, I certainly never got, I don't think I hardly got any prep from, from the school. I think I might've yeah. done some, some stuff outside of school. But. Yeah, and math is similar. So in general, our students have um, both great SAT scores, and more importantly, from ninth grade, they have a target. So depending on what your SAT is, you can look at, oh, average SAT for Harvard, wow, got to get there. Average SAT for University of Nebraska, oh, maybe not a big deal. And so at least they know, anybody can, I think if people have goals and they know where they're going, they can generally achieve those goals. We're very focused on let's achieve your goals for college from an early age. And then the other thing is college courses, advanced placement are one option, but right now there are hundreds, thousands of MOOCs you can take online. And so we recommend that the students, you know, focus on getting the SAT score they want um, with our support, and then also taking a few college courses and doing well on them so they can prove to colleges they've done well on them. And then finally, the projects themselves um, are very impressive, impressive achievements for college admissions. Just to riff on that briefly, you know, there's a notion that you need regular extracurriculars, you know, varsity sports, student council, volunteer work, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, colleges would actually prefer to see something substantial. So um, when I went to Harvard, there was a kid who was elected mayor of his town in Michigan, and he had very low SAT scores, but nobody cares about your SAT scores. If you can, an 18 year old, you get elected mayor. Um, I just have an intern who got into Harvard and he did, had no traditional education but he was a professional actor on an AMC show alongside Pierce Brosnan for a couple of seasons. So it's a little more impressive than a, a score on exactly, some weird taste. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I've had, I had a student who did uh, created a three day music festival in Austin bands from around the world, $80,000 budget that helped him get into UT Austin. I had a student who was published in Atlas Obscura, a website with a million monthly page views edited by an Atlantic journal editor that helped him get into Bard college. And so basically, the combination of SAT college plus real world achievements is a great approach to getting into college. I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up in a minute and give each of you the chance to uh, sort of give your final pitch to any parents out there kind of listening to this, who, uh, you know, wh why they should at least give the school a little more thought, at least reach out and maybe schedule a call to learn a little bit more. But Mikhail, I want to more specifically ask you, you know, as, as we discussed, you dropped out of school completely uh, and you didn't even have as formal as an education as this expat international school is going to provide. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious what your pitch is to someone. Uh, why, why should their child enter in this, into this school instead of just being like Mikhail, why don't they just drop out altogether? And, uh, you know, it seems things seem to have worked out for you. Successful entrepreneur, podcast host, author. Why would you recommend doing this instead of necessarily the complete Mikhail method of just dropping off and, and running away and taking off? <laughs> well, I can answer that from a diff couple of different fronts. I mean, straight off the bat, the things that I went through were extraordinarily hard. Now, I wouldn't trade any of those experiences for anything else. But what I am trying to do is give my daughter and and my son, my, my son is a newborn baby, but I do, will want to give them all of the advantages. I think that is a very normal thing. All parents want to give their children all the advantages in the world. Now, when I looked at education for my daughter, we looked at all of the options that are out there with private schools, with international schools. We looked at homeschooling. I had said that I was going to homeschool my whole life. We looked at unschooling, at world schooling, at all of these types of things. And up until I met Michael, there was really nothing out there that I morally and ethically felt compelled to send my daughter to. So we actually went out there and created it. We created a viable solution for families who respect liberty and freedom, who want entrepreneurship for their children. Um, I mean, we were just talking now about university. And if my daughter wants to be a doctor, I will be very happy for her. Obviously, from my side, I would be 
thrilled if she would like to follow in her father's footsteps and be an entrepreneur and do what daddy does. Doesn't have to be the same as me by any means, but whatever she wants, I want her to be happy. That's it at the end of the day. I don't think that what public education is set up to do is to make children allow them to be happy and successful and get what they want out of life. I mean, we don't know how long we have on planet Earth, and I don't want to waste anybody's time, and I don't want to waste my kids' time going to school in an environment which is horrible and a detriment to her mental health and her well-being, which is exactly what we're seeing right now. So in a nutshell, I went out there and created what I would consider the best education after reading roughly 3,000 books, traveling to over 100 countries, speaking multiple languages, living all over the world, working with mentors, um, you know, living a very, very full life. I went out there and created the school that I wanted for my kids. Does that make sense? It sure does. And uh, Michael, I'll, I'll let you take us home. Give us the final pitch for why anyone on the fence should consider checking this out. At least, at the very least, schedule a call with you guys, learn a little bit more. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll start with a very simple metric. If you suspect that school is a waste of time, listen to that suspicion. Uh, it is a waste of time. Maybe not for all kids, not all schools, but if you suspect that your child is somehow not using their time as optimally as possible, if you think that your child is not learning as much and as fast as they could, listen to that voice. If you think your child is not as flourishing and happy and vibrant and alive as they could be, listen to that voice. Just give you a couple of examples. You know, I think the system has told us that we need school. Now, learning is useful. School is not necessary for learning. Mikkel is a great example. Our series, When School's Not Working, look it up, whenschoolsnotworking.com, has about 50 interviews with educators, but mostly with people who had alternative educational paths and rocked it. We've got um, John Deming, whose daughter, Laura Deming, um, got into Harvard at 14. She was complete, and got into MIT at 14. She was completely unschooled, you know, and she had no traditional transcript but she was capable. So what I always look at is, um, would I wanna work with this person? Would I hire this person? Would I start a company with this person? And that's what matters. And yeah, if you're a math rock star, maybe get into MIT at 14. If you're creative, do you deliver a great creative product um, on time that impresses me? Do I care what grade you got in seventh grade science? What? It's just insane. I think once people really look honestly at what matters as an adult, in terms of personal happiness and well-being or professional performance. And they'll really look at how many hours of school actually were relevant to that achievement. And for me, uh, you know, reading was valuable as a kid. Uh, how much of school was valuable? Very little. So bottom line, listen to that voice. If you think your kid is not thriving or is not learning as much or as valuable a material as they can, listen to that voice. Nothing else. Talk to us. And even I'm happy to recommend other programs. So if your kid's not a right fit, but they're not thriving, let's talk and let's find a program where they will thrive. All right. Well, just uh, again, on, on one final note, you know, this is my uh, my sort of I'm not just a spokesman. I'm a client moment here uh, because I, you know, I, I am doing this. I wanted to bring you guys onto the show because I have uh, personally witnessed the the benefits of this school. Uh, I have seen someone exposed to an entirely different uh, kind of learning. And it's not an instant switch. Like you said, sometimes it can take some time to adapt because. Yeah, he is used to being told what to do. He's used to being told, do this, go to the bathroom then, and on all of that stuff. Uh, but I can already see how much value there is in it firsthand, uh, how much value there is in showing that you can be independent, that you don't need to just have your entire day dictated to you. You can actually guide what you want to do, guide the things you want to learn. And and to to see someone getting that at a young age, where I, I was probably legitimately in my 20s before I started thinking about, about some of the things that, you get to, that he gets to learn um, in this school. So I can't recommend recommend it highly enough. I don't think it matters where you are. If you're someone that's been considering pulling your kid out of public school in any way, shape or form, I think this is definitely something that could be a first, a great first step, even if you have no plans to leave the country or be mobile or, or in, in any other way. Uh, so that's my final word, but I thank you so much guys uh, for coming on the program. I really do appreciate it. Great to see you again, Mark. Thanks, Thanks so much. Come visit us, expatschool.io. You guys can find out more on our website, schedule a call with us, sign up for our newsletter. We're putting out lots of great content on there. So even if your kid is not quite of the age yet, we're happy to keep in communication for when they are. expatschool.io.
Thanks so even much. Even if Mark. you're just even if you're just working on having a kid, you can still you can still get some information. We know? actually have a lot of people like that who are like, really? Uh, really? I my my son is two months old and I'm just trying to get ahead with their education. So all right. Great stuff. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Keep up the great work. Keep on roaring. All right. So Bye-bye. Bye. All right, kiddies. I hope you enjoyed learning more about the Expat International School. Uh, again, check out more. Book a session. You can learn more about it directly from Michael or Mikkel uh, over at expatschool.io. And that wraps it up for the flagship for this year. I'm really excited about next year for a couple of reasons, and I want to tell you about them right now. First of all, we got some new branding, some new logos. We are still Lions of Liberty, but we have some updated logos that you should be seeing popping up there in your podcatchers. And with new logos comes new merchandise. So I want you to head over to lionsofliberty.store, check out our revamped. It's not probably right as of this, as of the time you're listening to the show, it's probably not there quite yet, but very soon, within the next week or two, we will have revamped merchandise uh, with our new imagery, new branding, new logos that sort of thing. And of course, the best way to get that merchandise is by using your discount that you get by becoming a patron of Lions of Liberty. You can support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. You can also now support us on Locals over at lionsofliberty.locals.com. Uh, and now, if you were already a member or a supporter on one of those platforms, you would have already seen the debate between Dave Smith and Spike Cohen on Borders. Uh, this was an awesome, awesome debate debate, guys. I was absolutely floored. Uh, probably one of the best, if not the best debates that I've ever hosted. Uh, and this one is for patrons, live for patrons. It was live for patrons, live for our locals people. The normies of you out there, we love you, but you do have to wait until next week to hear it. So tune in on January 3rd, the very first episode of the year of Lions of Liberty for that Dave Smith versus Spike Cohen debate. But if you just can't wait, you can head over to Patreon or Locals right now. And there's no better time to join because right now, really between now and December 31st, just a few more days, about four more days left, uh, we are giving away two free months if you join up as an annual member on our Patreon. Uh, now, locals, we don't really have that option. So, you know, there's another promo we can get you for locals. Uh, we are you know, letting people sample locos. We're going to be sending some, some free codes out for that. But for Patreon as well, if you want to just join up for a whole year, we have so many levels. We give out so much free merchandise, have so many bonus shows like Conspiracy Corner, Brian's Good Morning Fuckhead, uh, Degenerate Gamblers, bonus segments with guests. Uh, so, so, so much audio content for for you out there, as well as live versions of my program and many of our other episodes, including, of course, the aforementioned Dave Smith and Spike Cohen debate. So if you get on there right now, an annual membership, you get two whole free months. It really does not get better than that folks. Uh, lastly, as we wrap up, before we head into the new year here, I want to let you know we do have a slight tweak coming to how our feeds are going to be coming at you. Uh, if you are a fan of all three of these shows and you listen to each and every one of these shows each and every week here at Lions of Liberty, you don't necessarily need to do anything. This feed will remain intact. Uh, the name of the feed is going to change. Instead of just being called Lions of Liberty, which has just been the, the name of my show really since the beginning, it's going to be called the Lions of Liberty Network. So the Lions of Liberty Network feed will be just like this feed you've been listening to. It will have all three of our shows. It will have myself on Mondays. It will have Brian uh, with Electric Liberty Land on Wednesdays, John Odermatt with Finding Freedom on Fridays. Occasionally, we may also have some extra bonus shows within that feed uh, where all the three of us cross over when we get together for uh, various uh, roundtables and that sort of thing. Uh, additionally, however, uh, and this can be either if you really are just more of a fan of one of our shows or if you just want to you know, get, get a little more uh, organization in your feed, mind you, but we are each getting individual podcast feeds for each of these podcasts. So my show will still be Lions of Liberty. So you can find that feed as Lions of Liberty with Mark Claire. You will also be able to find Electric Liberty Land and Finding Freedom as separate feeds. Uh, it may not be, it might not be up by the time you're listening to this, but within a week or so. So I just, we just want to give you a little bit of a heads up. So you can subscribe to the individual feeds. Now the individual feeds may also have some extra content of their own because there's oftentimes that we have some extra content content we want to put out, um, or we do a segment on another show that we really want to share, but we just don't want to clog up this main feed with it. Uh, so a lot of that stuff will be on those individual feeds. So you could just subscribe to all three. You could just stay here if you want. Uh, if there's just one show that you, you know, you prefer to listen to all the time and you just want that one in your feed, you can just subscribe to that one. We just want to give you guys all of the options. So that's what we are doing heading into the new year. That being said, 
Heck, there's just a few days left. I'm going to go. I'm going to go live the rest of the new year in style here in Mexico. So I wish you all a very happy new year and thank you all for your support. Until next time, until next year, my friends. Live long and live free.